a seminar. I'm excited to welcome to our team early. Most of you know them because they're collaborators for the Albert and Janet Sass Nano initiative. Uh, we have two um, exciting presentations this morning. Um, one uh, by Joachim and one by Shirley. Two completely different um, research areas, but equally important. So, uh, introductions to the speaker short. So, uh, you can see uh, Joachim's uh, uh, impressive uh, one slide CV up there. Uh, Joachim is known uh, for his uh, work on developing particulate drug delivery systems for a variety of applications, but today he's going to focus, I guess, more on agriculture and food applications, because that's the project that we are currently yeah. working on. There's a lot of publications and patents, and I said I would keep, I would keep the introduction short. Um, oh, I want to uh, introduce also yeah, Shirley. Nice. I, I guess the slide is further down. Okay, so that's further down. Okay, but then maybe uh, we should stick with Joachim and then I will introduce Shirley at the end. So, without further ado, um, I will invite to the podium Joachim uh, and uh, save your questions at the end because we are recording this, uh, uh, the, this uh, presentation and it's going to be also on, online as a video. Being here, pleasure as always, and the floor is yours. Thank you. So thanks, Phil, for the very kind introduction. I think I'd like to thank Phil as well for inviting me uh, to Harvard to give a talk to, to all of you. Uh, it's, it's indeed it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, to, to share some of the research work that we are doing in Singapore. Uh, it's related to, to sorry, just one need to move the mouse. So I, I've actually given it a title, uh, Encapsulation Systems for Controlled Delivery in Agro-Food and Biomedical Applications Through Sustainable Approaches. Uh, one of the keywords here, of course, is going to be sustainable. I think if we want to be able to commercialize anything, uh, sustainability is, of course, going to be one key consideration. For example, in terms of uh, how do you make them? Is it going to be sustainable? Is it scalable? Uh, is it going to be uh, receptive or received by the public itself? So where is Singapore? I think uh, Singapore has made this mark recently because of the president of, of the US, uh, Donald Trump, is going to visit us. Uh, for a simple reason, because he's going to meet his good friend from the North Korea to have the Trump Kim Summit in Singapore on the 12th of June. So I'm going to arrive in Singapore on the 11th of June, and uh, they're going to have a summit on the 12th. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to land safely in Singapore, in a sense. So Singapore is actually right smack uh, in the Southeast Asia, uh, just below Malaysia and Indonesia. So we are between uh, these two countries. And... Um, and Singapore is actually a very small country. Uh, it's about 278 uh, square miles. If you ask me, north to south, it's actually 15 miles. East to west is, is about 23 miles in total. And uh, NTU, Nanyang Technological University, is, uh, is housed, situated on the western part of Singapore. Uh, when we go for lunch, sometimes we fill to the restaurant. You can actually see Malaysia right across the causeway over here, where you see all the trucks going in and out of Singapore and Malaysia. So this is NTU, uh, this is Singapore. We have uh, very nice uh, gardens. Recently, of course, we had the gardens by the bay. Uh, this is the M Marina Bay Sands uh, Hotel, where it's like a ship uh, sitting on three pillars. And of course, the bottom part is NTU. And I come from the School of Materials Science and Engineering. This is our school. Uh, in NTU, of course, uh, we also have new buildings. Uh, for those of us who are into Chinese food, for example, you have, you have recognized that this looks like the, the, the basket of dim sum that is stacked on top of each other. So we call this the dim sum building, in a way. But I think I'd like to start off with this slide over here. Uh, as a material scientist myself, uh, uh, we always uh, like to use materials to talk about human civilization. And we all know very well that human civilization actually starts uh, 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 with the Stone Age, where uh, the cavemen would use... Uh, uh, ceramic materials to make potteries, to make uh, weapons, for example. And of course, this has evolved into the Bronze Age. And during the time of the Bronze Age, uh, bronze is actually the hardest known material known to men at that point in time. 
And uh, of course, being hunters and gatherers, they would use bronze uh, as, a, as a material for hunting as well. And human civiliz civilization actually changed with the, with the, with the advent of iron. Because with, uh, with iron, we can make a lot more things. For example, if you look around you today, uh, the rail is made of iron. So it comes with transportation. Our vehicles is also made of metal, uh, airspace as well in terms of aeroplane, and that actually changes human, human civilization a pretty fair bit. But of course today, uh, the buzzword is nano, and if you ask me what age are we in today, I would say that we are in a polymer age because of the, 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 the things that are around us, the chair that you're sitting on, the clothes that you're, that's on your body, the shoes that you're wearing, they are all made from polymer. But what's also very exciting is that uh, we are also in the nano age, as you can see from this picture itself. Um, starting from how it is coated with a nano paint that prevents corrosion. Uh, you have uh, nano materials that is coated onto the, 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 the window pane over here that is thermochromic, which means that, uh, it changes color based on temperature. You can have a uh, a bicycle that is made from buckyball or carbon nanotubes that make it super light, yet super strong. And you can have a lot of other things. So, for example, some of the nanomaterials that we make in NTU itself, uh, they may look like flowers. So some of these are actually being used in the end node of uh, lithium-ion batteries to allow them to be, charged, to be supercharged at very high rates. They can also be used in, uh, for example, in uh, DSSC uh, solar panels that converts uh, solar energy into electricity. And you also have other types of nanomaterials that are actually being used or being explored today for different types of application. So if you notice that uh, all these nanomaterials has to do with um, the building and the infrastructure. How about food? I think uh, this picture doesn't show much about food and that's exactly what we're gonna talk about uh, this morning itself. And when we talk about food, we are always interested in encapsulation. Can, are we able to deliver nutrients, for example, so that they get better, higher bioavailability? Are we able to use encapsulation as a technique to actually increase the yield of crops or to increase um, the yield of uh, food as well? And encapsulation has been used uh, pretty widely. It's, it's reported in the paper, in the literature. Uh, people have started working on, for example, uh, lipid-based nanocarriers. You may have heard of this anti-cancer drug, Doxo. Is actually uh, uh, delivered by using it's currently in the market. Or you can have inorganic particles as well. So people work with gold nanoparticles, silica nanoparticles, serum uh, oxide nanoparticles, and the list goes on. Uh, virus particles, viral particles are also used. I think uh, some of the, 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 the exciting things about viral is that uh, you can use it very efficiently to deliver genes. So part of the work when I was in Mayo Clinic was actually to compare uh, the gene delivery efficiency of virus versus or attenuated virus versus nanoparticles. But what I really want to focus on in today's this morning is really on polymer-based nanocarriers uh, using biocompatible polymers, biodegradable polymers, or even better, nature-inspired polymers to achieve some of these aims. So as mentioned, sustainability is one of the keywords in, in, in the presentation over here. And what does sustainability mean? Number one, of course, uh, as mentioned, if you want to create a product, you have to ensure that the, that the consumers are willing to purchase it. So we have Shirley later on to talk a little bit about uh, um, public perception towards uh, nanotech and, and, and how the public will actually perceive the use of nanotech or the application of nanotech in food, for example. Sustainability also means robust scientific research. I think uh, the collaboration between NTU and Harvard uh, uh, would allow for this robust uh, research. Uh, industrial Scalability, uh, we don't just want to make small scales. I think for a technology to be able to survive or, or, or to be used, it has to be scalable. More importantly, of course, is the ROI, return, return of investment. Um, are we able to get back our investment after putting in so much money into R&D? Green manufacturing. And of course, very importantly, is to be able to engage our stakeholders. So we work very closely with our regular, regular tree authorities to ensure that uh, whatever that we are coming out with uh, has a demand and a use in Singapore. Why food? I think for us to be able to survive, we need air and we need food. And of course, if you look at this diagram over here that talks about uh, the growth of food across the world, 
you can see that uh, China is a growing market. We have Japan as well. We have Southeast Asia. We have uh, Russia. We have uh, India as well. And if you if you were to to, to realize that um, uh, food is going to be a billion dollar industry, and uh, uh, the economy of the world is probably going to be driven by Asia in the next uh, 15 years, and uh, the demand for food is therefore going to accelerate. Food is going to reach um, 320 billion by 2020. Going to be in Asia Pacific, and in Singapore alone, um, although Singapore is small. The, the revenue is expected to show an annual growth rate of 14.9%, uh, and this will give rise an estimate of about uh, 260 million US dollars by the year 2022. Besides money, of course, the other um, uh, noble reason why we are also focusing on food is because of food poverty. Uh, we know very well that one third of the globe is actually facing starvation, in a sense. And if you look at this diagram over here, you will see that. Uh, the number of deaths around, across the world is not due to cardiovascular or cancer, but it's actually due to hunger-associated deaths. And there has been a recent call by the Bill Gates, Melinda Gates Foundation to look into uh, affordable, accessible, and appealing uh, next generation of nutrition, and how can we use encapsulation as a technique to deliver nutrition to the, the, poor, to the poorer countries. And in Singapore, of course, and across the globe, uh, the third reason is because of food security. Uh, for example, uh, can, we, uh, can we give uh, food security a bit of boost so that uh, we can ensure that we have food at all times? So Singapore being small, we don't have a lot of space uh, in Singapore for agricultural farms. And we actually uh, import 90% of our food from across the globe, starting from in Asia, in Thailand. So we import rice from Thailand, for example. Uh, we import uh, beef from Australia, from US. So when you come to Singapore, uh, you will see that uh, US flown beef, and those are usually more expensive, and people will go for those, for example. And uh, most of the things are, are just outside of Singapore. And how can we therefore ensure that we continue to have a, a strong supply of food in Singapore? It's really to look into technology net, one example. So we can use nanotech. Uh, in, in agriculture and food, so for example, are we able to use delivery systems or encapsulation systems to deliver pesticides, targeted pe uh, pesticides such that it doesn't kill everything, but only focusing on where you want to kill off the insects, for example? Are we able to deliver fertilizers so that we know exactly when to release what fertilizers? Or in terms of food, uh, can we deliver flavors, for example? Or are we able, even better still, can we increase the bioavailability of nutrients when you take this? So in Singapore, we have what we call the vertical farming. So this, this is actually a... ...plants have equal amounts of uh, sunlight. So how can we deliver nutrients? How can we deliver fertilizers and pesticides to this? This is one challenge that we are trying to address. So let me give you one example. So this is a project that was recently funded by our own government agency on aquaculture, growing of fish. So fish, when they grow, uh, the most expensive thing in fish farming is actually in a fish feed. So the problem with fish feed is that uh, when you throw the fish feed to the fish, um, there, are, there are two issues. Uh, the fish do not consume the feed immediately. And therefore, you have the leaching of the amino acids into the water. And that causes uh, pollution of water, number one. It also means that if you were to throw in one kilogram of feed, the fish will probably only grow by 500 grams because the fish is not consuming everything that you're throwing into it. So what we're trying to do over here is therefore to be able to find a way to encapsulate very expensive amino acids that will allow for better what we call a feed conversion ratio. So when you throw in a kilogram of fish feed, for example, you want the fish to grow by 110 grams, oh, sorry, 1.1 kg, not possible. But if we can achieve a 100% conversion, then we have a 1 kg of meat in that sense. Another area that we are also looking at is to use uh, na natural food-derived polymers to create encapsulation systems. So what, we have, what I'm showing over here is, for example, in okara, the use of okara. So uh, tofu is one of the, the uh, big food in, in Asia and also used and widely consumed in, in, in Western countries as well. So when you make soya bean milk, for example, or you make tofu, the leftover product is known as okara. 
And Okara is actually a, a, a waste product in these companies, and they're actually paying people money to dispose it. Oh, food what is to take this food waste to convert them into biopolymers that can be used in encapsulation, for example. So we are very interested in trying to deliver new trustuticals. So what are new trustuticals? So the definition of a new trustuticle is it's a type of dietary supplement that delivers a concentrated form of a presumed bioactive agent, nutrient or non-nutrient, but from a food origin, in a dose that must exceed that of obtained from normal food in a balanced diet. So for example, uh, these days, if you, if you buy um, um, products from a supermarket and if you to look at the label, it says fortified food. So it means that it has been added with some kind of nutraceutical to give it the extra uh, boost in terms of nutrients. And the global nutraceutical market is estimated to be about $285 billion by 2021, growing at a rate of about 7.5%. Of course, there are problems, and that's why we're all in research. So what are the key problems with nutraceutical? Number one, low bioavailability. Bio so you can throw in a lot of uh, nutrients, but whether or not use it is another separate issue altogether. Because a lot of these nutraceuticals are made of labile compounds. They are very sensitive to pH, for example. And we know very well that our stomach has got a very low pH, in a sense. They have got very low solubility, and therefore they do not absorb very well into the body. And when, the, when you exceed certain concentrations, for example, then it may even be adverse effects. So our goal is therefore to be able to develop safer and sustainable consumption of nutraceuticals through green manufacturing procedures, using food-based materials and grass materials, or what is known as generally regarded or recognized as safe materials. So what we want to do is to be able to use kylosan. So why kylosan? For a simple reason, is because kylosan itself is a mucoal adhesive polymer. So we're not doing nano for the sake of nano. There's actually a rationale reason behind it. So when we bring it down to a nano level, kylosan can actually pass through the mucosal lining for it to be absorbed by the body. And what we want to do next is actually to be able to functionalize these kylosan nanoparticles with a special type of food-based polymer, such that if you want it to be released in the small intestine, it will be released in the small intestine. If you want it to be protected in the stomach, in the small intestine, in the colon, you can also do that. So we call this targeted delivery. So if we know a certain nutrient that is being absorbed in the small intestine, for example, then we will coat it with a certain enteric coating, to prevent the acid in the stomach from attacking the nutrient and to be re released only in the small intestine. If you want to be able to target the gut microbiome, for example, that is found in your colon, you can therefore protect the nutraceutical from the stomach, from the small intestine, and to be released only in the colon. So we basically want to develop a food-grade targeted nutraceutical encapsulated nanocarrier to deliver nutraceuticals to specific parts of the GI tract to increase bioavailability and enhance efficacy. So we worked on a fruit, a fruit that, uh, um, uh, according to my student from India, she says that everybody stressed by it. It's known as the retinolite coagulants, and it looks like this. So we bought a few kilograms of this from India. We ship it to Singapore. And what we want to do is we want to test its efficacy because everyone says that, oh, it's got wound healing property. It can cure you of cancer. Uh, if you have diabetes, you, if you take it, you know, you, you can be assured that uh, your sugar levels will drop. So we wanted to make it, uh, uh, to, to ensure that there's scientific rigor to it. So, so we bought some of this and then uh, we crushed the fruits. We did a hydro-alcoholic extraction of the compounds in there. We did a fractionation as well to separate out the organic compound and, uh, and the aqueous compound. So the organic compound, we have actually labeled it as P2. And the, and the aqueous compound, we have actually labeled it as P4. And so now what we're going to do is that we're going to test it to see whether is it really uh, um, uh, efficacious. So we also studied the, and characterized this compound. We use FTRR. We ensure that the, that the groups are there, the, the functional groups. And we did NMR, for example, through our, our collaborators. Uh, we studied both the organic fraction P2 as well as our 
aqueous fraction P four. We did first, of course, we wanted to evaluate in vitro. We wanted to know if it has uh, uh, anti diabetic properties. We started off with mean six cells. So mean six cells are basically uh, cells, pancreatic cell, beta cells from mouse, and we tested across different concentrations. So this graph basically plots insulin flow change against concentration of P4. And we observed that there's a certain concentration that allows for an increase in insulin in mean six cells. But looking at just in vitro results isn't good enough. What we did was that uh, through our collaborator, we did some animal studies on diabetic mice this time. So if you look at this graph that talks that, that uh, plots less time, a normal mouse would have enough insulin such that the blood glucose is normal at day zero as well as day five. And for diabetic mice, you will have noticed that they have got very high blood uh, glucose levels because of the lack of insulin. And what happens is that when we feed, fed these mice with our P4, you will observe that there's actually a drop in the blood glucose level. So we actually uh, have shown the efficacy of this uh, compound P4 in both in vitro as well as in vivo studies. Next, we, we wanted to, to evaluate whether any of these compounds has got uh, anti-cancer properties as well, because this has been claimed by, 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 by people in India. So what we did was that we compared uh, P2 and P4 against uh, commonly used anti-cancer drugs. So you may have heard of 5-FU, for example. You may have heard of doxorubicin. These are the two drugs that are used to treat uh, colon cancer. And we tested across different cell lines. We tested on a cancer cell line, a colon, cancer colon cell line, known as KCO2. And we tested on normal cell lines as well, um, fibrocellular colon cells. And what we observe is this. We observe, when we look at the IC50, which means that the concentration of the increase the cell viability by 10, we observe that our P2 requires only 1.89 of this compound to kill off KCO2 cells. If you compare this against 5-FU and DOCS, you will realize that uh, 5-FU and DOCS require a much higher dosage to achieve the same killing effect. But what is more interesting is that we observe that although it is very toxic to KCO2 cells, it is actually less toxic to normal cells. So which means the IC50 on fibroblasts and normal cells is actually much higher compared to KCO2 cells. On the contrary, if you compare 5-FU and doxorubicin, these are very toxic to normal cells. So we actually observed that there's a very good selectivity of P2 against cancer cells while keeping normal cells re relatively intact. Uh, and we also did notice that P2 is the one that has got an anti-cancer effect and not P4. So now we want to be able to encapsulate it. We want to be able to use the properties of P, P4 uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an anti-diabetic um, compound and the properties of P2 to kill off uh, colon cancer, for example. So we have to be able to encapsulate them into heterocyte nanoparticles. And what we did was that we actually do electrospring as a process and by changing certain parameters, for example, by looking at the heterocyte concentration, we are ab therefore able to get nano-sized heterocyte nanoparticles uh, so some of this has already been optimized to ensure that uh, we actually achieve nano-sized particles of chylosan. So how do we target? We know very well that we want to be able to target uh, P4 to the small intestine and P2 to the colon. So what we did was that we developed enteric coatings using food grade materials, grass materials. So we used starch for example. So we coated our particles with starch and we coated our particles with resistant starch. And what we observe is this. When we compare against commercially available enteric coatings, the reason why we can't use commercially enteric coatings is because uh, these are all made from polymers and may not be suitable for food use. And so that's the reason why we de decided to develop our own enteric coatings. When we compare soluble starch, for example, against Eudrogit L100, where it's supposed to be released or dissolved only in simulated intestinal fluid, we observe that starch protects whatever that's in there 
from the gastric fluid because nothing is being released. And once it comes in contact with stimulated intestinal fluid, it actually dissolves away. And this is actually comparable to um, Udrajit L100 that's actually available commercially. So which means now we have an enteric coating that can protect the, the sensitive compounds in, uh, in the gastric and allow it to be released only in the, in the small intestine. When we look at resistant starch, for example, resistant starch protects the, com the, the, the components in the gastric fluid, the intestinal fluid, and it dissolves away only the polonic fluid, the enzymes. Against another commercially available polymer, it behaves exactly the same way. So right now, we actually have a food-grade polymer that can be used as an enteric coating for us to target it into different sites of the GIT. So when we encapsulate it and when we coat it with these enteric coatings, we, first of all, we look at P4. So we want P4 to be released only in the, in the, intestinal, in the small intestine. So you observe over here, the black line basically looks at uh, chylosan that contains P4. So everything comes out very quickly, whether in the stomach, small intestine, or so and so forth. Whereas when you do this enteric coating, the compound P4 is actually delayed in its release until much later on. And what we did was that uh, we tested out in cells, in mean six cells this time. And we also observed that only the particles that have been coated with starch, for example, you get a much higher release of insulin in the in, uh, simulated intestinal fluid. When we look at P2, for example, this time around we want to be able to target the colon. So we coat it with resistant starch, a little bit of it gets released as compared to kairosan, pure uh, naked kairosan particles. And then later on, uh, once it reaches into the uh, simulated colonic fluid, it gets released. So we also observe that our P2 compound becomes effective because this is, talks about cell viability. It, there's more killing because it's being protected and released only in simulated colonic fluid. And some of these things are still currently ongoing, and we are looking at publishing this work pretty soon as well. Oh, that's, uh, that's what I have to, to talk about with regards to food. And uh, at the same time, we are also developing other types of encapsulation systems for the delivery of uh, pharmaceutical products. And I'm going to run through some of them and uh, to, to look at how we are actually developing some of these particles to achieve a uh, certain kind of uh, therapeutic effect uh, from these particles. So one of the earlier work that uh, was done in our group was actually to make uh, multi-layered particles that look like this. So as you can see over here, this is a double ward particle with a, with a layer on the outside and a, another polymer in the inside. And what we wanted to achieve was this. We, we know very well that uh, cancer patients who go through chemotherapy, they go through one round of uh, 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 chemotherapy using a drug, and then after that they go through a second round of chemotherapy using a different drug. So what we want to achieve is actually, can we have a one-time injection where you get the first drug to be released, and once the first drug is completed, or once the course is completed, the next drug kicks in. So we, we, we came up with a, with a way to create multi-layered particles like this with different drugs loaded in different, specifically loaded in, into different parts of the particle to achieve this effect. And most of the time when people create multi-layers, they have a core, they go through a second step of a, of a layering, third step of layering. This is, uh, this is um, actually a one-step process where we get multi-layered particles and different drugs localized into different layers all in a one-pot, one-step synthesis process. So we pour the polymers together, we pour all the drugs together, and by doing some, some stirring and changing some parameters, it self-examples into something like this. So if you look at the Raman mapping itself, you can see PLA is on the surface, PLGA is in the core, and you have one drug in the core and another drug in the shell, in that sense. And what's more exciting for us is that we observe that when the drug in the shell is being released, we can tune it such that when it's close to its completion, the second drug kicks in. So we get what we call a sequential release of drugs from just one particle alone. And we can also tune the release profile by tuning the different designs of the particle by having a porous shell, for example, by having a, uh, if you have eaten mooncake, you know, some mooncakes contain an egg yolk in there. This, this looks exactly like that. You can have an egg yolk in there. So you can have one drug in, in this egg yolk and another drug on the other part of the particle itself. So by designing different structures, different morphologies, we can actually use it as one way 
to alter drug release uh, uh, profiles. What we did, of course, was to look at anti-cancer effects. And uh, we loaded uh, two different drugs in here, Palitaxel, as well as doxorubicin. Uh, so doxorubicin is actually highlighted in red, Palitaxel is in green. As you can see from the, the, the confocal microscopes, that uh, they are actually uh, very nicely um, um, located within the core and the shell of these particles. And we tested them on, um, on tumor spheroids. So we wanted to be as close to uh, in, in vivo experiments as possible. So instead of working on 2D cell culture model, we collaborated with someone to look at uh, 3D spheroids. And as you can see over here, 3D spheroids are from day two to day six. If nothing is given to them, they actually do grow in size. When we give them PLGA, which is basically just the polymer itself, the, the spheroids will also grow. Interestingly, when we deliver free drugs, free palatexal drugs to these uh, spheroids, uh, they continue to grow, although at a much slower pace. But the moment we encapsulate them into the particles itself, we observe that the spheroids actually get smaller. And the reason behind this is, number one, our particles provide a controlled sustained release of the drugs. Number two, uh, using some other things that we have also measured, we observed that the particles do go into the spheroids. And by the fact that it goes into the spheroids, you actually get a much greater uh, efficacy in killing off these cells. The next thing that we studied was on wound healing as well. Uh, so wound healing is actually one big area that uh, is of great interest in Singapore. And we observed that by having the compound and getting different release rates, that would also influence um, um, the rate of wound healing in mice, especially diabetic uh, mice. One big area that we are very interested in, uh, that I work on with, in collaboration with our clinicians in our medical school, is with regards to diabetes. So um, you may be surprised to know that uh, uh, Singapore is one of, is probably number one in, in, the, in, in the number of diabet diabetics across the world. So it's estimated that uh, one in every three Singaporeans is going to be diabetic in the next few years. So our Ministry of, of Health is actually declaring war against diabetes. And one key project that we are working on is that uh, can we take islet cells? Islet cells are cells that are found in the pancreas that produces the insulin from healthy donors, and we transplant them into the eye of uh, diabetic patients. But the problem, as we all know very well, is that the moment you do such transplantation, your own immune system is going to get rid of the islet cells. So that's where our materials come in. We actually encapsulate uh, immunosuppressing drugs uh, in one part of the, of the, of the of particle, as well as another drug to increase the production of insulin from these islet cells. So what we have shown over here is that when we introduce the islet cells into the anterior chamber of the eye, the islet cells actually get killed off pretty quickly in a matter of uh, 10 days. But the moment we encapsulate rapamycin, which is actually uh, an immunosuppressing drug, in nanomolar dosages, we actually get the islet cells to survive for a much longer period of time, up to 20 days in a sense. So this becomes a very interesting model because the big question therefore now is that can we therefore transplant islet cells into diabetic patients with these particles such that these patients can avoid having to take medication for life? This is the big question that we are trying to answer right now. And these are all done in mice and we are actually moving this into monkeys. The next thing that we are also very interested in is to use, is to create floating capsules that looks like this. Um, and these floating capsules are very useful to deliver nutrients as one example. But what I'm going to show over here is that we can also use it to treat uh, different kinds of diseases, Parkinson's disease or for example, a cardiovascular disease. So what we did was that we created a, a, a way to encapsulate drugs into nanoparticles like this and put these nanoparticles into a capsule. So if you were to have a capsule that is about uh, 100 microns, and if you use a knife to slice it open, all your nanoparticles will actually flow, flow out from there. And each of these nanoparticles can contain a drug each, drug A, B, C, D, E, F, G, depending on what you basically want to encapsulate within this compound here. And what we want to achieve is that we want to make these particles float in a gastric. Why float? The reason is because we want to be able to use the stomach as a reservoir to release the drugs. Because a lot of drugs are actually being absorbed in the small intestine. 
And the reason why there's such low bioavailability of drugs is because the drugs are taken in the stomach and it gets drained off very quickly. So one of the first experiments that we did was, that, was to create this and to look at how floatable are our particles. And we observed that through stirring uh, in, in SGF, the particles uh, remain afloat because we were able to put uh, some chemicals into it that keeps it afloat, some food-based chemicals. And you can see that when we load different dyes in there, we can, get, we can also observe it on the confocal that we can see that the particles are very nicely encapsulated within this microcapsule. The first work that we did was to look at in, into loading different types of uh, cardiovascular drugs, a drug for hypertension, a drug for diabetes, and a drug for uh, high cholesterol, for example. And we, and, we, and, we, and we tune it such that we can get different release profiles so that it can actually fit into the profile that is required by the patient. But uh, we got a grant from there, and we decided to work on Parkinson's disease. Why Parkinson's disease? It's because people with Parkinson's disease take their drugs four to five times a day. And each of these tablets contains three drugs each. And because of the fact that they take drugs four or five times a day, they go through a spike of on, off, on, off, and they have a lot of side effects, dyskinesia uh, motion side effects. And one of the biggest problems in, uh, in treating Parkinson's disease is that can we therefore get a very nice slow sustained release of these drugs so that the problems and the side effects are all completely mitigated or removed. So what we did was that we loaded three different Parkinson's disease drugs, levodopa. Levodopa is actually metabolized by the body to form do uh, dopamine in the brain. And two other drugs, entacapone as well as cabidopa. So these two drugs actually maintain the bioavailability of levodopa so that the majority of it actually gets converted in the brain. So we, compared, we did this study, this pharmacokinetic study in, in, in mice, and we compared this against commercially available tablets. So as you can see, the mice that are given the commercially available tablets, the levodopa goes up within half an hour, and it spikes off very quickly. So this is the reason why they have to take it five, four to five times a day, because it goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down, goes up, comes down, all the way until 24 hours. So by using the delivery system that we have developed, we are now able to get it to go up and to come down in a much gradual, slower pace. And with this design, what we did was that we decided to test, test the, the bioavailability of these drugs. And what we found through our pharmacokinetics parameters is that levodopa, which is the main drug that gets converted into dopamine, the mean residence time is about 2. Five, seven hours, and with our delivery system, we can get it up to five times that of the currently available tablets that are out in the market. And more interestingly, we observed that when the, when the mice were given the commercially available uh, tablets, their dopamine levels spike very quickly, and then it comes down very quickly as well, giving them the effects. Delivery the tapering off. So instead of having four, four or five times a day kind of dosage, we are now working with our clinicians to make it just once a day. And uh, uh, we recently just got another grant to move this into monkeys. trials as well. Uh, the last few slides, uh, one, of the, one of the earlier work that I did on nanoparticles was, was to use nanoparticles to deliver drugs to, for bone infection. So. Um, Osteomyelitis, or what we call bone infection, is, uh, is a big problem among di diabetic patients. So when you have a bone infection and it's not cleared up, then you have, uh, you have some, something like this, and the patient actually goes through um, amputation of the, of the extremities. And patients with um, osteomyelitis, doctors will give them up to six weeks of antibiotics every day. And if that doesn't clear up, they have to go for surgery to open up and to put beads like this in there so that uh, the drugs can be released locally. So we ask ourselves uh, this question, can we actually tap on nano, nanotechnology to deliver drugs to treat osteomyelitis? So using the previous uh, technology, we, we loaded antibiotics into these particles, and we wanted to make it bone biocompatible because we want to target bones. So in order for us to make it bone biocompatible, we have to coat it with a layer of bone mineral. So using a very simple technique that only requires five minutes, we therefore coat our particles with hydroxyapatite, which is basically a bone mineral, to give us particles like this. But this is not good enough. 
because we want to be able to target this to specific sites that are infected. So using the, the, the knowledge that I gained while I was at Mayo Clinic, what we did was that we used bisphosphonates and we modified these particles with bisphosphonates. And what we observe is that when we modify this with bisphosphonates, uh, and we introduce them to bones, so basically this is an SEM picture of at low magnification, at high magnification. These are all bone slices. So this is a control on how bone looks like uh, under low mag and high mag, and how bones look like when they're introduced with non-modified particles, so nothing sticks to it. The moment we modify our particles with bisphosphonate, we get a very strong attachment of these particles to the bones. So we know very well that uh, these drugs can therefore be targeted to infectious sites in the bones. So I think this is something that is still currently ongoing. Uh, we are now working with another orthopedic surgeon to see how this will actually work in the animal model. Uh, besides those that we have discussed so far, we also create other types of particles. Uh, the polymers that we have been discussing so far, they are mainly hydrophobic polymers. So what, what happens if you want to, to, to deliver peptides? What happens if you want to deliver bacteria? If you want to be able to, to deliver cells, for example, cells for a therapeutic reason, then we create what we call a hydrophilic, hydrophobic core shell particles, where the core is actually made from a polymer known as alginate, that is hydrophilic, that allows cells to grow in there, for example. And, uh, and this is actually coated with a layer of a hydrophobic polymer. So we know very well that anything that you put into an alginate, the agent, or the therapeutic agent comes up very quickly. So what we do is that through this one-step process in creating a core shell particle, because of the hydrophobic barrier, we are therefore able to get a more sustained release of the therapeutic agent that is being released from such delivery systems. So these, these are how they look like. You have uh, alginate in there that is coated with a layer of uh, PLGA. Um, uh, when, when, when we receive a phone call from GSK uh, saying that uh, they have got a peptide that needs to be released at very accurate doses, uh, we decide to, to develop particles like this. Uh, so these are all hollow particles that are used for peptide delivery. And the reason why we make them to be hollow is because we do not want our peptide to, be, to interact too much with the, with the polymer. Because as the polymer degrades, it may have some adverse effects on the peptide itself. So how do we make hollow particles? Most of the time when, when material scientists were to make hollow particles, you create a core, you put the next layer on top, and then you go through a next step to actually remove the core. This is actually a one-step process to make hollow particles like this using sodium chloride. So by playing around with, the, with, 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 with osmotic pressures, we're therefore able to get hollow capsules like this through a one-step process. And the beauty behind this is that we are also able to tune the thickness of the shell to be very, very thin, so thin that when you look at it under the optical microscope, you can see through the whole particle, or very thick walls like this as well. And by changing the, the thickness of these walls, you can actually get different release profiles of your peptide. Yeah, I'm going to skip all this. The last one um, that we recently just uh, created, these are known as Janus particles, as you can see from the images over here. So Janus actually is a, Janus, it's a Roman god that has got two phases. So using, using a special technique, we can therefore get... Um, okay, the mouse is not moving very well. We can actually get particles like this, where the beauty behind this is that you can therefore load different drugs in different compartments of the particle. And we are currently using this to, 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 to deliver uh, drugs for the islet transplantation a model that I've just mentioned earlier, where one side actually releases rapamycin against the T cells that may affect it, and the other side actually releases um, 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 then towards the islet cells so that they can actually secrete more ins insulin. Okay, I think that's about all. So in conclusions, I think I've given a, a very quick overview of the kind of work that uh, we do in, in NTU, the School of Materials Science and Engineering. Uh, not just for biomedical, but as mentioned in the earlier part of my presentation, also for agro-food uh, applications as well. And uh, with this, I think I'd like to acknowledge the people who has been uh, a great help uh, to the group, the group members. Uh, Karuya, she's the one, for, uh, she's my PhD student from India, who actually thought of the, the vitanol-like coagulant uh, uh, compound. Uh, Roger, uh, Alex, and uh, my colleague Kiwe. And of course, not forgetting the, my colleagues from Harvard as well, our lovely colleagues from Harvard, 
Uh, Phil, of course, the, my partner in crime, <laughs> who has been uh, leading this project uh, along with his team members, Glenn, uh, Kunal, Ramon, as well as uh, Joe Brin. Uh, a list of collaborators, uh, the more recent ones, of course, would be uh, AVA, who has uh, funded us, as well as uh, Ferrero as well. And, of course, my other members who are not involved in this work, but has played a, an essential role in creating a lot of the particles that we have been developing. Uh, so this is after a barbecue event in NTU. And uh, my daughter, yeah, she's of course much older now, not much older, but slightly older. This is probably taken about three, four years back. She's now 10 years old and my son, eight years old. And thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the session. Yeah.